Hello, welcome to Critical Witness. Oh, we've got a bit of an echo somewhere. Someone's watching it uh, live. Welcome. Uh, I'm not Hello. in my usual witness. Hold on. I think we've got an echo somewhere. Someone, uh, it, Dr. Ian, if you're watching it live while we're watching, we get a bit of feedback. Um, right. So we we're, we're live. We're in my parents' home, <laughs> so I haven't got my usually. Uh, my usual setup, we've got a nice grandfather clock behind me. Just going to focus in on that. And we're uh, going to get stuck straight in with our guest, uh, Dr. Ian Paul. He's with us talking about revelation and the relevancy of it. Um, Dan's already not convinced that it's relevant at all. He's a bit of a heathen in that area. So uh, we're, we're going to try and convince Dan uh, this evening that he should read Revelation more. Um, he's already shaking his head. So without any further ado, let's get uh, live and okay. convince Dan. Uh, um, so Someone is echoing. <laughs> um, Dr. Ian, have you got uh, YouTube open at the same time as you're listening to this? <laughs> um, Dr. Ian, have you... I'm not sure. Um, hold on, we're having a bit of a technical issue, guys. Um, so if YouTube is open, you should only have StreamYard open. Uh, if you've got multiple tabs open, then we're going to get an echo and a bit of feedback. Um, if YouTube is open, you should only have Stream. Once, once we get this sorted, we'll uh, get straight into Revelation. Um, is open. Has that worked? Hi, that's great. Okay, so I've got there to <laughs> I you had Twitter just... open. Oh, it's Twitter. It was live streaming on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know Twitter. Yeah, it's all good. We're on. We're on three feeds. So if you had Facebook open, you'd have got it even more. So, um, oh, good. sorry about that. We're, we're, we're all good. So, uh, obviously, I, I've dropped Dan in it. He, he's, he's not that negative towards Revelation, but we, we'd like to get stuck in. And uh, before we do. We'd love to hear a little bit about who you are and uh, why you're a Christian. Um, and, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know, how, long, how long do you uh, – no, no, okay, I can't, I can't go all the way back and, and give a detailed account because that would take more the whole hour. Um, yeah, I, I was brought up in a church going home, um, in, um, and my mother was an Irish Catholic from Dublin, and uh, so she was – we took us to Catholic Church. My father actually converted from being a high Anglican to being a Roman Catholic. Uh, and um, so it was brought up in that kind of context, although faith never was real for me. I think there were people in the church for whom faith was real, but uh, not for me. I was, I was an altar boy, so I, I learned how to wear a red cassock very nicely. Um, but I ended up going to a different church uh, through a sort of a bizarre series of what at the time seemed like coincidences. We had a friend of my parents who uh, their daughter, Dr. Daughter, came to see us, and um, she introduced me through her the school she went to and she invited me along to this youth group and one of the people said hey do you want to come to our coffee bar afterwards and i was thinking oh bar that just sounds a bit risky but it turned out they were actually very friendly people and over a period of about six to nine months i discovered that um through going to this youth group cipher group that that faith was something that was real that made a difference and um i could sense it making sense for me and i th i think at the time i felt that this kind of made sense. It was kind of not quite an intellectual exercise, but it made sense. But actually, I realized looking back, actually years later when I had to give my testimony, that one of the crucial things was the fact that these people welcomed me. I was a, a bit of an insecure teenager going to an all boys school in London, uh, which is pretty competitive. And actually having people who simply welcomed me uncritically and uh, seemed to want to be my friends was made all the difference. So I think for me, that's always been the, the, the dynamic with faith is that it's partly about in relationship and welcome on the one hand and it's about making sense and understanding faith on the other um so yeah that was when i was a teenager so that's a, a few decades ago now um i went off for a year off lived in israel went to uni studied maths pure maths uh and um, then began to think about what should i do with my life and um i began to reflect on the gifts god had given me and talk to others and it was quite a strong sense that god was calling me into a ministry of teaching the faith to others so I looked around and thought, well, who does that? And the answer is people with their collars turned around. So began to explore that. Went to the vicar of my local church uh, where I grew up, and he said, oh, I'll be waiting for you to come 
and talk to her about that. So that was a like, confirmation. But I didn't want to go straight into uh, ministry, straight from um, university. Uh, I, I had actually felt God was might be calling me into inner city ministry, which in fact never quite transpired in the way I expected. So I wanted to experience an industry. I ended up working for Mars Confectionery in Slough, uh, which was I learned all sorts of things there. Uh, I learned how to make chocolate, which is fun. <laughs> and I, I sometimes say, look, if we get bored about talking about Revelation, we can talk about making chocolate. But I never do that now because everyone immediately says, yes, let's talk about making chocolate. So we did <laughs> chocolate. I've, um, I've never, I've never, sorry, I was just going to say, I've never liked Slough. I failed my driving test there. Within, I hadn't even left the driving test centre and I failed it straight away. <laughs> That's quite impressive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Sorry, uh, I just yeah. you, it's you great. Slough's great when you when you actually if you're going by train from you know, from Paddington when you come to the station and the train pulls in and the woman announces goes Slough this is Slough it's, you can feel it's the Slough response. So, <laughs> uh, well, so people who lived in Slough used to actually if they wanted to big it up they used to call it North Windsor. Uh, so North Windsor. North Windsor. <laughs> they built a new housing estate on the south side of Slough. They just called it North Windsor. So, uh, um, yeah. Then I, so anyway, so I, I then had to study theology. I came to Nottingham. I uh, did a degree at the university. I got a first. So I then stayed on. Did a PhD in New Testament and looked at the book of uh, looked at the book of Revelation. So, um, and uh, then I met Maggie, and I thought quite quickly I'd like to marry her. And she was a doctor in Poole in Dorset, so ended up living in Poole for 10 years. And then we uh, came back with, by then, three kids back to Nottingham in 2004. So this is my, my second time in Nottingham. So uh, is that potted enough? Yeah, no, that sounds yeah. great. That's, that's great. Pool, pool's much more glamorous than Slough. Yeah, it is, although you do, you do sorry, apologies to anyone from Poole watching, you do find, slightly feel as though you're just about on the edge of civilization about to drop off. That's a slight exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I travel, I, well, I used to in the old days. You know, in the old days when people used to travel and go places? Yes. Um, like that. Remember that? Yeah. About it. yeah, yeah, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> Us oldies can remember it, you know. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I used to travel around quite a bit. Traveling from Poole to anywhere is just, just um, impossible, really. So, um uh, actually, being in Nottingham, where I am, uh, is is great because I was uh, ten years. I was teaching in the theological college here, and then right. I left. I left in twenty thirteen, part partly because um, I just had a word from God, and the the word when you know when people say I've got a word from God for you, they don't mean a word. They mean like a par central paragraph or a whole flipping book or whatever it is. I actually yeah. had one word, so a word from God, and the word was right. W r i t e. So oh, is it not so correct? I, <laughs> uh, no, 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 right, right. It was, it was imperative, imperative. Though. So I, uh, yeah, I tried to do that while I was still teaching at the college, but it didn't work out. And so I ended up, I left in 2013 and I've been working freelance, doing writing, writing a blog, writing books, uh, doing some teaching in different contexts as well. So um, it's, been, it's been interesting. But it has meant that uh, I had already learned all the things that everyone struggled to learn over the last year, like how do you work from home and how do you, how do you establish your own routines and how do you have discipline? How do you focus on things? So I've been practicing that for the last eight years. So when everyone said, oh, lockdown is really stressful, I kind of go, well, what, what lockdown? I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's actually, I, you know, we're, we're, yeah, I know exactly. With a, with, a, with a family in the UK, which has probably been actually practically affected the least of anybody because, uh, well, number one, because I've worked from home already. Number two, my wife Maggie is a GP, so she's just carried on working. I mean, her work has changed. has been more demanding, but, Mm. She's continued, you know, consultations, and um, we're in a we live in a kind of multi generational, multi ethnic, multi person household. So we look after Maggie's parents here, who are eighty eight and ninety, and our kids come and go, um, at sort of post uni and uni. Um, and we've also been very, both of us separately, very committed to community living as well. So we've always sort of lived open house. So we variously mm. have we have one or two or three people staying with us at any one time. So so we haven't been isolated in that sense. We've, we've, we've over the summer last year, there were nine of us in the house, I think. Wow, um, sounds so nice. Works, works good. Yeah, it's, yeah we're, it's nice if, you, if you've actually got space for, for that. So. But the Lord <laughs> did provide us with, with space. Um, and I love gardening. I've been gardening, in, you know, particularly at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, the weather was fantastic. And uh, so I spent lots of time in the garden. I'm a big gardening awesome. fan too. Ah, okay. I was going to yeah. talk about palm trees soon. So uh, before yeah. we do that. <laughs> I, had a, I had a palm tree. I planted a palm yeah. tree last year in the garden. I love a nice trappy trappy when we, when we live, Yeah, exactly. When we live in Paul, I, I planted um, three trappy in the garden, and they were like this high. 
And when we drive back and see friends now, they're like, you know, up oh, to the ceiling. I love it. So. Sorry, we'll, we'll save that at the end. We can talk about you. Can <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we'll become a gardening show. <laughs> we, should, we should do. We should do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I planted 24 cool. trees in our garden since we've lived here, by the way. So, there you go. Very good. You start, Very it's started now. This, this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talking about talking about covid that's that's something yeah. so i was aware of your uh blog for a little while but i noticed um you sort of had four minutes of fame as you called it earlier on on sky news recently mm -hmm. how did that come about that you were you were interviewed how was that um a connection you'd made already or? no no um well i mean doing doing work with the media is very very hit and miss because um my my experience is that that, that folk working in tv radio it's quite a high turnover of staff. Also, they've got a lot of different subjects they want to talk about. So my my observation is they don't keep a file saying, Oh, if we want something on the Church of England, we need Ian Paul and we'll just have, we'll get we'll just go go like because Puffin, they want a variety of uh mm -hmm. voices. So so it's pretty it can be pretty random. Um the it, it's worth cultivating relationships. And uh, I and actually I reflect on my experience and wrote on wrote on the blog, and that's probably where you saw it about um how to how to do media stuff I, I was very fortunate because um when i first studied theology in 1989 when i came to nottingham first um one of the staff there stephen travis who actually ended up becoming my one of my phd supervisors he was very interested in the media so we actually did a three-week media course in the at the end of the of, of second year in the summer just the end of the summer term um and so that was my first introduction to sort of recording and stuff in those days it was pre-digital so one of the major things we did is learn how to use a ewer tape recorder so literally if you want to you know nowadays you do you do this editing you cut and cut and splice and whatever so yeah. you would actually physically do it so you have to get out a, 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 a razor blade and learn how to cut the tape and how yeah. to put it together and glue it together that was how you put clips together so i, I spent a few days doing it with my life doing that but it made me aware of the whole question of media. And that's meant that since then, I've always said yes. One of the things I say in my blog is that um, the me media moves very fast. And so usually somebody will say, oh, we've got a story. We need to find a spokesman on this. And they've got two hours or three hours or at most 24 hours. So my comment to people to say is if, if, the, if someone from the media phones you up and they want a story, they want to interview you, if you can say yes. So it might mean moving other stuff around. It might mean dropping everything, doing some preparation. If you can say yes, and if you whatever whatever it is, the 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 more you do it, the more it confident you'll get doing it. So the first time you you do something live or even on pre-recorded, it can be pretty terrifying, but you learn by experience. So I always encourage people to say, look, take these opportunities because again, it's a bit like you know stuff on on social media. If mm. the sensible people don't do it, then they'll get the nutters, <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 conflict always makes a good story. So mm -hmm. they want they want you know if you're going debating with somebody, they want some of the extremes. Um, and I'd, on this particular occasion, I'd, I'd been one of the people who'd signed a letter saying that, um, it, 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 that I didn't think it was right the government should be, should be unilaterally closing um, worship spaces, buildings. And um, I think I, would, I was my name, I was like seventh on the list, and the first six people said no, and I said yes. So that was, again, so that's a, a, an example, a lesson of what to do. <laughs> Um, and, you know, because I've done that, actually doing stuff on TV is harder. I've done a lot of stuff on the radio. Um, and in fact, actually, one of the things that, that the whole lockdown thing has tested is, is, is church leaders' media skills. And in fact, when you're pre-recording yeah. something to camera on your computer, it's actually not like doing TV. It's actually like doing radio, because when you're doing broadcast service and things, most people are just sitting in their own in their rooms watching. They're sitting at home watching, maybe one other person. So there's a sense in which you're really speaking to one person. One of the key things about radio is imagine you're sitting in front of one person, and that person is represented by the camera. Um, so I'd done quite a lot of quite a lot of radio stuff, a lot of local radio stuff. I'd been on BBC TV, BBC TV before, in a live debate on um, Victoria Darvish on BBC Two um, on, on the question of sexuality in the church. That was interesting. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's good and it's good to get experience. And actually, one of the things that's interesting, I used to teach preaching when I was teaching at theological college. And one of the things about doing media stuff is also you learn all sorts of skills, which are really helpful for preaching. For example, you learn that you have to speak spontaneously without going um um. Um, and actually speak continuously. So that's a really, that's a great skill for yeah, preaching. Clarity well. of, yeah, clarity of speech is really important. You might have great yeah. theological points, but if you can't yeah. express yeah. it clearly, then... Succinctly then... and clearly, and in a way that people can understand. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And so it, it's really... And when I'm doing a radio stuff, I always have lots and lots of notes, and then there's a question when the conversation comes up, you pick up the thing you've prepared, which is which fits the 
the thing the other person has, has, has said, and just said, yeah, there's lots of lots of just some basic skills which, yeah. are, which are really useful and transferable in other contexts. We could probably learn a few things, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> It's not very nice, is it? <laughs> I meant we. I, I was a collective. I was. I, I thought you said. I thought you said. I thought you said you. I thought you could learn a bit. No, I was, I was yeah. putting myself in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what did you actually say then, Ian? That like, so if you maybe a quick sort of summary. So, what did you actually say about this sort of situation on on Sky News? Well, I think the, for the question about um, closing church buildings, uh, I essentially I said uh, that. Um, you can't reduce life to the commercial that actually the spiritual is really important and that for uh, all sorts of people um, that actually meeting physically together to worship God, it was really important. And that the churches in the situation of COVID have got something really significant to offer a message of hope. So I actually managed to sort of slip the gospel in there as well about, um, you know, uh, that we're, we're confronted in the pandemic. And I think, I think I was very conscious of this in the early months that one of the things the pandemic did was in our culture, and I, I think we've lost the sense of that now, but it confronted people with the reality of, of death, yeah. mortality. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the creation account in Genesis says that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. And the Anglican funeral service says, you know, from dust you came to dust you shall return. And uh, so that was a reminder of mortality, but that the gospel gives us hope in the face of our mortality. And, you know, during the pandemic, we shouldn't be closing things down. We should actually be allowing people to engage with those kind of spiritual questions. So that was it in a nutshell. What what sort of pushback did you get from that? Because I can imagine, I can imagine you probably did. Like, so why, you know, sort of, you know, why should why should the church be? Uh, be treated well, well, you any see, I was very to... careful to guard my language. I talked about places of worship, so I wasn't trying to. I wasn't. I wasn't arguing for. Yeah, know, sorry. Yeah, I just mean church, powers. but I mean worship in worship in general why should religious people have access to um to to worship and to meet given the the unknown risks i guess that at that time we still didn't quite know how serious it was going to be well as it as it as it turned out the risks were not actually evident i mean the, and in fact you know we still have this restriction that we we, we have in person services um, with um a physical distancing and we're told we're not allowed to sing in fact and i, I get a, i get a nice way in from my wife who's a doctor and there's actually no research evidence to suggest that singing presents any risk at all. And I think what the, the difficulty is, what's happened is that when in the early days of the pandemic, we didn't know what the risks were. So everyone was ultra cautious. But yeah. actually, when the evidence became clearer, these restrictions haven't haven't been revisited properly. So right. and I think I think that, that's a concern. Um, but I think I mean, it's interesting just reflecting on that. Um, one of the I, I think there's, there's two or three big questions that the pandemic has raised for for us, for the questions of faith. And I think one of them, which is which is pertinent, which is, if I put it this way, do our bodies matter? So, you know, they've been, for a long time, there've been people who are proponents of a virtual church. So, I mean, virtual church has been going for sort of 20, 30 years. People have had, um, uh, what's the place called? St. Pixels Online Church. And there's been an argument saying, aha, we said all along that you could do online church. You didn't actually need to physically be together. So, you know, now's our moment. Well, I think one year on, I think most people I talk to say, we now realize that physically meeting really does matter. And it isn't the same, you know, having a broadcast service and sitting at home and looking on your TV screen. Actually being in the physical company of others makes a difference at, at all sorts of levels. So I, I guess we probably should have realized that anyway, I mean, in the sense that God made us, a, a non-material God made a material world and made us bodily people in a material world. So... I guess we could have had some clues that it does matter that we're bodily and that in the incarnation, Jesus became embodied mm. and that he was bodily raised from the dead. Therefore, our hope is bodily resurrection. The Christian hope is not that our spirits leave our bodies to be in a disembodied reality with God in the sky somewhere. Um, our mm. hope is that there's, I've told my wife, by the way, when I die, I want to be buried, not because anything magical, but because it's a, it's a symbol of hope of bodily resurrection. Uh, that we we await Jesus return. So so that that's one sort of kind of important learning thing for us. I think the other thing that um, we we've learned as well is that I think for some church leaders I've spoken to, the pandemic has been a good time to think and to, to ask some questions and say, what are we actually doing? What what are we doing on a Sunday? Um, what what's our goal? Um, and um, I think those who haven't asked that question have struggled most. But 
Yeah. The question is, what, what, what do we what do we come together for on a Sunday? Well, maybe we, we come to have a an effective encounter with God in worship. We come to read Scripture together. We come to we come to form friendships, to meet one another, to spend time together. To to we come together to encourage each other and to provide mutual support and care. Uh, we come to learn, to teach, to be taught. Now, I think those who've responded, who've risen to the challenge of the pandemic best, are the ones who said, "Well, okay, if we can't if we can't actually physically meet." In, on a Sunday in a building, how do we do those different things uh, well? And one of our experiences is that mid our midweek group has really blossomed, and we've we found the discipline on of Zoom means that you know in, in a room it's easy for a couple of people to dominate the conversation and others to sit quietly. Actually, on Zoom it's much harder, which is why some people don't like Zoom. <laughs> but uh, uh, actually, someone it's take up that challenge though. <laughs> well, to say oh, yeah, but but um, that. We've actually found that that meeting on Zoom has made us um, kind of more structured, more disciplined. So we've actually got to know each other better. We've actually been more systematic about saying, "So what have you been up to today? What's been happening in life? What you know?" Um, and and there's some great online learning materials as well. We've used a lot of Bible Project videos, which have been really good. Um, oh, so it's yeah. actually been very, it's actually been a very, in some ways, quite a positive time. So yeah. yeah. I think that's interesting. I think there's a there's a challenge that we're currently working through in in the church that I help um on, on the leadership team just discussing how much when we do go back of the online variety we, we keep and how, how do we do that yeah. well yeah in, absolutely and keep it inclusive keep it um so yeah. that but then so as we go through that the technical expertise of doing both online and in person ends up yeah. requiring extra manpower and things like that yeah. so it's it's quite an interesting um yeah. discussion that probably needs to be had I'm, and it's, been a, it's been a resource challenge you know so we mm. suddenly find out that the key person in the church is the one operating the video desk yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it, it becomes like that the church doesn't have a video desk you know <laughs> so, i'm aware of time and just um yeah i know revelation is quite an intense book <laughs> but it kind of links into what we're talking about with regards to um the situation we've found ourselves in in the last 18 months um yeah. revelation has been used and abused over the last 18 months um so i'd be interested in uh just discussing a little bit about whether or not it's relevant today um dan will probably have some conversations on on some of these sort of ethical side as that's something mm. you've dug mm. into mm. um so i i guess just just start with as someone who's specialist in in revelation um what are the most frustrating things you've seen uh, in the last 18 months <laughs> with, with regards to uh, <laughs> the use of revelation? Uh, the, the COVID vaccine represents the mark of the beast and we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to be have chips put in us control and it's all part of a one world government and the tribulation is going to come and blah, 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 all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> Multiply so that not... by about 10,000, you know? <laughs> yeah. So is there so any truth in that? uh well okay in some in, in, in a roundabout way there's more truth in it than perhaps i'm you i might at first say um uh i there's a sense in which now if i can put it like this um i don't know if this makes sense i think um the the, the book i i i my, my conviction is the book of revelation is the most important and the most neglected book of the new, new testament and and actually are the church's neglect of of reading this book well has actually given us all sorts of problems. Now, the reason I say that is because we live in a culture and ideology which are at odds with a lot of biblical values. And uh, we need help in engaging with... And the, the trouble is, you know, people talk about, you know, fish are the, are the last thing to realise they're swimming around in water. We're, we're the last people who realise the culture that we're immersed in, the assumptions we're making in our culture. So when we look at, when we look at Scripture, where would we look to see a worked example of how the gospel critiques a different ideology and different culture yeah. and equips uh, followers of Jesus to, to live faithfully in that culture. And the answer is the book of Revelation. It's implicit in other parts of the scriptures, but of course you see Jesus is preaching in Israel. Paul is writing to mixed Jewish Gentile groups. Um, and there is a tension there between with, you know, ideology, the ideology of empire and the social context they're living in, and we can see that tension at various different points. You do have a theology in John's Gospel of a, a quite discontinuous relationship between the disciples and the world. You know, Jesus says, you know, you, in the world you will have trouble, but I've overcome the world. 
but in Revelation, we actually have a worked example of a group who in the late, for, for this for argument's sake, so late first century uh, Roman province of Asia, so that's the west end of what we now call Turkey, uh, quite a distinctive part of the empire uh, on the on the eastern edge of empire, so threatened from the east by the Parthians, feeling a bit insecure, an environment, Turkey, where they had a lot of earthquakes, the sort of physical insecurity as well, and, and the followers of Jesus who, who are becoming detached from Judaism in terms of their identity. Therefore, they're losing the, some of the protections and concessions that Roman imperial power has given to the Jews. So they're a very vulnerable group uh, in, as it were, kind of now an alien culture. The question is, how do you live faithfully in that, in that context? So I think that's the context we find ourselves in the church today. We are, Christendom is gone. We are shrinking. We're a small group. Um, I think in any part of the church, there's an, there's an increasing recognition that the way Western culture is going is, is rapidly further and further at odds with the inheritance, heritage of Christian values. So how do we live faithfully? And if only we'd, we'd actually as a church spend a bit more time reading this book well, then I think we'd have been better equipped to face some of the, the, the changes and the rapid changes in culture we faced over the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 years, really. Um, mm. So, yeah, and I think for, for me as well, I, I, I go on to say that there's a sense in which the kind of, some of the kind of popular readings of Revelation that um, we, we come across actually, I don't know how this sounds, they actually function as judgment over us <laughs> mm. uh, in, in two ways. One of the things that I, I, met, oh, did I mentioned, I've written a commentary on Revelation. So, <laughs> Phil, you've yeah, got yeah, a copy yeah, of it. Before we went live. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Phil, Phil, so Phil, you've got a copy of this. Dan, you haven't yet bought your copy of this. So, but I, mean, I haven't, no. I mean, so it's <laughs> But I mean, one of the things that I aim to do in this, in this commentary, it's in the, in the Tyndale series, is um, uh, point out two really significant things uh, of the book of Revelation. One is that it's absolutely saturated with reference to the Old Testament. So I actually lost a week of my life um, some years ago when I actually counted them up and I actually tabulated them. And of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, they contain 676 allusions to the Old Testament. So well, yeah. Every verse, you're just tripping over Old Testament imagery. But of course, the question is, for most of us, most ordinary readers of the Bible, how well do we know our Old Testaments? Do, how well do we know Zechariah chapter 12 and chapter 4? Are, are we immersed in Ezekiel? Do we understand? Have we made sense of Daniel's visions? And do we understand one, the one like a son of man coming on the clouds and all that kind of stuff? And the answer is, well, probably the best kind of a bit. Yes, we can kind of get that. But um, so, but but if you if you don't recognise, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament background, then you're going to be you're going to struggle with Revelation. The other thing that Revelation is saturated with is ideas from its own culture. So we we tend to think that Revelation four and five are these sort of timeless visions of heaven, but mm -hmm. but actually they're they're all pretty weird, really, all sort of rainbows and things and creatures and angels and and people singing repetitive boring charismatic choruses you know worthy 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 all that kind of stuff which aren't which isn't jewish worship jewish worship we find in the psalms is really quite different from that and people dressed in white rather than in the colored robes that the high priest would, would, would wears you know in from the old testament and so on we don't realize how odd it is because it's so much influenced christian worship and imagery and actually in mingled with interleaved with stuff from the old testament you have stuff from imperial worship the worship of the emperor in the first century and you have mythology behind that revelation chapter 12 the heart of the book everyone goes to the heart of the book it's absolutely weird hmm. it's got a woman who's pregnant she's being pursued by a dragon the dragon wants to eat her baby i mean honestly what, what is that <laughs> it's like john's having a bad dream well the trouble is if you live in the first century you know perfectly well what that is that's the leto and that's the leto apollo myth where python the the the, the, the primordial dragon pursues Leto, who's pregnant by Zeus, to consume her child who'd been prophesied to be his destruction. And it turns out that the child who's born, by two children are born, are Apollo and Artemis. And then four days later, Apollo actually slays Python. Um, so so if you were living in that world, you know that story perfectly well. I mean, so if I mm. started talking about uh, a, a, a girl with a, with a cloak, with a red hood, and goes into the forest to take apples to her granny and meets a wolf, I mean, that would sound weird if you didn't know the story. But if you know the story, you can see I'm just sort of, you know, drawing on common knowledge. Don't, and I guess for me, yeah, go on. Sorry, Dan. I say, don't, don't, is that, don't Roman Catholics think that, or, or don't some people think that's Mary? Uh, yeah, it's not. So that's you. you... Well, the re sorry, the reason I say it's not is the sense. There's a sense in which 
there's that you could see an allusion to Mary and that Mary is the one who is pregnant and gives birth to the Messiah. But actually, yeah. in terms of the range of biblical imagery, um, you get in uh, Isaiah 66, you get in Micah 4, you get this the image of either Jerusalem or the people of God who are like a woman in the pains of labor because she's longing for deliverance. You get the joke. <laughs> the, people of, the people of God are suffering oppression from foreign powers and they're waiting for deliverance. deliverance and by yeah. the way, that joke works in Hebrew and Greek as well as English. I discovered That's a few cool. years ago it doesn't work in Kyrgyz or Russian um, because <laughs> I was in... I was in Kyrgyzstan and was teaching about this, and I and I mentioned this, and they all just looked at me completely blankly. So it does <laughs> it does depend on, on the cultural context uh, that you're in. But just going back to the stuff about vaccine and whatever, the, the reason why mm. it functions as judgment over us is because all these readings of Revelation put us at the centre. Mm. So uh, Revelation must be about me. Uh, it's a book of crisis. Revelation must be about my my crisis. Oh my goodness, COVID lockdown. Uh, uh, we're having such a crisis. It's the end of the world. Oh, yeah. Revelation must be written about my day, about the end of the world, because that's what it says in it. It's about the end of the world, isn't it? Uh, and it's a judgment on us because so often our uh, popular Western readings just put us at the center and they put our culture at the center as if the whole world kind of revolved around us and the whole world was waiting until we came along and said, oh, great, you know, now we've reached the the peak of civilization and you know what we haven't <laughs> but that, but that's, that's not just revelation is it i mean that's 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 like a western oh. approach to, to mm. scripture isn't yeah. it i mean read about yeah. jeremiah the plans i have for you know yeah, and people yeah, say yeah, oh that's yeah. me that's me and it is um, is it not and and yeah. it's that kind of thing isn't it you take that approach yeah. to scripture yeah you're gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and i think well, you know one thing i say to you is that, that yes at a, at, a, at a spiritual level, we read scripture because Father God speaks to our hearts by the gift of the Spirit. He's poor us because of Jesus uh, dying and rising for us and now sitting at the right hand of the Father. That is true. OK, what's also true is Father God speaks to us through what the Spirit spoke as the words of Jesus to people living 2000 years ago. who didn't speak English, didn't have don't have iPhones have not had the internet yet and live in a very different world. And you know what? Their world was full of warfare. It was full of famine. It was full of uh, the earth shaking and buildings falling down. And it's, it was full of life-threatening things. It was full of actually the kinds of things you see coming with the four horsemen in Revelation chapter six. You know, I say to people, what do you think? How do you think John and his readers would have read the four horsemen? They'd read it and go, oh, that's our world. Huh? That's the world we live in. Yeah, we, we recognize that as our world. And I think, again, you know, when people say, oh, what an amazing crisis. This is the end times crisis. The Great Tribulation is coming. I say, well, I don't know. okay, hang on a second. Uh, let me think. The Black Death in the 14th century killed a third of Europe. You don't think that's a bit more of a crisis than what we're facing right now? Or yeah. what, about, what about going back to the, um, the Plague of Justinian, where half the empire was wiped out? Don't you think that was a, a little bit more of a crisis than COVID lockdown? And I think, again, it, it, it challenges the fact that we lose perspective and we just think that everything's around the modern world. And, and, and it isn't. There's been plenty of times in history when the Genghis Khan led the Mongol hordes, you know, across and they cut a swathe across Europe so profound that you can measure in ice cores the change in the level of oxygen because of all the so many people were killed and the farmland went back to wilderness, you know, and trees grew and everything. So, I mean, I think we have had greater crises in the history of humanity than we're yeah. facing right now. So I think it's an exercise in having a bit of sense of perspective. It's also relative to, you know, uh, if you've been in Yemen for the last few years, um, then, you know, with that approach, you think oh, yeah. it's coming now. No, it's very relative to each individual country. Mm -hmm. And we think yeah, yeah. we're so we just think, oh, no, when we're oppressed, when something bad happens yeah, here, no, no, no. that's what it must be talking about. And you just think, yeah. just shut no. up. <laughs> but but again, I mean, you said this is what people do with the, with all the scriptures. And, and again, one of the most helpful things about Revelation is I say I get a Bible and just tell me. I say, okay, so uh, where is the where where is the book of Revelation? Okay, is it inside the Bible or is it outside the Bible? You go, well, trick question. It's inside the Bible. Yeah, fine. It's inside the Bible. So okay, if the Bible has a story, God made the world, loved the world, we turned from Him. Uh, God reached out to his people. He formed a people through Abraham, through Israel. He liberated them from slavery, promised land. They continued to sin, promised a savior. Jesus came and, uh, you know, formed a, the, the grace of God flooded over the bounds out of Israel into to a new Israel from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And one day Jesus will return. Story of the Bible? Cool. Yeah, okay. So, well, if Revelation is part of that, doesn't it tell the same story? Ah, huh, okay. It doesn't actually, it isn't a little appendix saying, 
yeah, all that stuff is fine. But do you know what Revelation is about? Is about the amphibious helicopters from the Russian forces which are going to land on the beaches of Israel, uh, and and it, that or, or COVID or whatever. That's that's not that's not mm. what Revelation is about. Revelation is about the fact that God made the world that we have sinned, that Jesus has died to redeem us, and that he calls us to live faithfully while we await his return. That is what Revelation is about. And so, it fits so, the rest of the Bible, which is not surprising, because when people when people first saw this from John, they didn't go, well, we got the Gospels, we got Paul's letters. This stuff's really wacky, but we'll put it in just in case. They put it in because they, they recognised it was telling the same story. And I guess one of the struggles people have is they think that Revelation is odd because it's telling a completely different story in the same language as the gospels i say no no no, it's the other way around it's telling the same story as the gospels but using completely different language and imagery well it's not completely different I, it does make me laugh that when um when <laughs> in, in in mark chapter 13 and matthew chapter 24 jesus goes apocalyptic on the disciples and says well you know in those days uh, well in the days to come actually within your lifetime the, the moon will be dark turn to blood and the sun will be dark and the stars will fall from heaven and you know the son of man will come on the clouds and, and all the disciples go good on you jesus excellent good we understand that a few chapters earlier jesus has sat in a boat by the lake of galilee and he's gone he said a sower went out to sow, and some of the seed fell on this guy, and some of the seed fell on this. And the disciples go, what are you talking about, Jesus? We've got no idea. And of course, now we do the opposite. We go, we go. oh, we know what the sowing the seed is. That's blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's really obvious. We'll make it into a Sunday school class. But all the apocalyptic stuff goes, and we haven't got a clue what's going on. It would be quite interesting, actually, wouldn't it, to do a Sunday school class on, on Revelation 6. Right, children, we're now going to cut out the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But, I mean, so the disciples, they, they, because they were familiar with the kind of writing we've got here, and by the way, they were familiar with the Old Testament, so they recognized the illusions, and they knew the mythology and the stories and the practices of their culture, it didn't look so strange to them. And it and, and therefore they, they, they said, okay, yeah, we, we've got that. We've got that. The, the, the problem is, though, I, I guess in defense of um, the, a weird book, yeah. is that that is the way I read it. I don't, I don't, I don't read it as as that that narrative of scripture is sort of self evident within within the book, and I think uh, uh, maybe and, and, because you haven't bought my and that's because I haven't got your reference. Right. It is, it is, it is. That's right, that's right. Um, I don't make sure. Sorry, I got to keep it in the frame here. <laughs> you just keep keep it in the background, propped up. Um, um, I have actually got it on the shelf behind me here. Yeah. I can see. <laughs> it is there. I didn't even notice that. We've got my product placement all sorted out, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it feels like a gear shift. You know, if I read if I read the gospel, like um, you know, I, I can I can understand like the nature of biography. But when when we get into a uh, you know um, apocalyptic sort of literature. I don't have any experience reading that. Like I don't, it, it feels, it feels when I approach the book that it's, that we've taken, we've changed gear and, and suddenly something that, um, you know, scripture suddenly turned from being, you know, not necessarily easy to understand, but it's I have, I have some, ex I, yeah, I, I, I can, I can sort of, it, it, sure. I, at least the feel like I can, I can understand what, 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 I, um, you know, yeah. what scripture is trying, trying to speak to. Whereas suddenly yeah, yeah. I get, a, yeah. I get into revelation. Yeah. And I just suddenly I'm like, okay, okay. He fell at his, his, his feet as if he's dead. And right, and after that, oh, you've lost me. I don't know what <laughs> I, I've sort of. I don't know what's going on because when you started talking about Greek myth, you know, I, I you know I have a you know sort of working knowledge of Greek myth and things like that. But oh, when, yeah. when, when even when you mentioned that, I I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't. I wouldn't have known that. I have no basis in which to know unless I read a, a nice commentary on it. That, well, that, exactly. That's what, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's, that's read, what's in mind. Yeah, no, unless you read Hegernus's collection of fabulites, fabuli number one hundred forty-six, I think. So you'd have to get quite a long way through to get the Leto myth. But um, yeah, no, indeed. Uh, and 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 here's the here's the danger. And this is the danger that I experienced. I mean, I actually first studied the Book of Revelation when I was a teenager, and I was going to the Roman Catholic Church in Alton Boy. I was going to the, the Anglican Church youth group, and a friend dragged me along to a Baptist Church Bible study group midweek as well. So I was a bit of a mixed up kid. And mm. and the leader said, oh, I think God's God's telling us to read the book of Revelation. And we all went to that. Oh, anyway, so, but he said, he said, it wasn't this one. He said, don't worry. I've got a book that tells us what it means. Ha ha. So we all went, oh, great. Okay. So he tells us the answers. And so, you know, chapter one, Jesus, you know, bronze feet, blah, 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 sword, eyes, 
band of gold around his round it actually get band of gold around his breasts we didn't know it was breasts then we thought it was chest because the english version disguised it but it's embarrassing jesus actually has breasts in chapter one that's another there's a reason for that but you need to read the commentary you know um and then then chapters two and three we go ah oh, oh these are a bit odd we don't know these places where are they oh ah oh, he said ah oh, my book tells me these are not seven churches these are seven ages of the church we all went oh we wouldn't have guessed that unless someone had told us no you wouldn't it's not true um, um so so we, and then then of course he went through and we got to laodicea and he goes the laodiceans are lukewarm and we all went yes and they all went the rest that of them went look at those anglicans they're all lukewarm yeah we know we're in the seventh age jesus must be coming anytime soon but of course no christians have ever <laughs> no, no, no christians have ever believed never said oh no we're only in the third age relax jesus isn't coming anytime soon every christian <laughs> in every age has said we're in the end times um, and that's partly, again, it comes back to a question of biblical literacy. So when people say to me, oh, we're in the end times. Oh, the tribulation's around the corner. I go, oh, hang on a second. Okay, so let's just read Acts 2, what is it, verse 17, where Peter stands up and says, uh, look, these men are not drunk as you think. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel wrote about. In the end days, I will pour out my spirit. I go, oh, so when did the end times start then? They go, oh. I hadn't noticed that before. Okay, and they go tribulation. Oh, what is what is Paul's teaching ministry in in his first missionary journey? Acts fourteen, Acts fourteen twenty two goes to Lystra and Derby. Well, how does Luke summarize his, his gospel message? Through many tribulations, through much tribulation, must we enter the kingdom of God? Okay, so like Paul thought that he was in tribulation. Okay, what about Revelation one verse nine? How does John? He's writing this apocalyptic prophetic letter it's a letter it's written to particular people in a particular time particular place he's writing a letter how does he be how does he open his letter one verse nine i john am your brother and your companion in tribulation yeah. and kingdom which are ours in jesus and i've had some big some punch up actually i meant punch up sorry, saying, oh you can't have tribulation in jesus and i go hang on a second what did jesus say in this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> or in Matthew 5, this is what one of the things I do in the commentary is trying to constantly connect what Revelation says and say, look, Paul says the same thing, but in different words. Look, the gospel says the same thing, but in slightly different words. Matthew 5, blessed are you when people persecute you and speak ill of you because of me, great will be, and all that kind of stuff. So it's just all, it's, it's Mark chapter 10. And Peter says, look at us, we've left home and brothers. And he goes, yes, and you will have tenfold who's left there and with it persecutions but in the age to come eternal life that's okay then so it's 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 it'll all work out fine in the end um sorry i'm right i'm i'm, I'm no, going no, around here, around here. So, yeah, you, so, uh, see, what was happening what was happening in my youth group was that instead of instead of us reading revelation i can't can I do this backwards instead of us reading revelation this guy helped me what happened was that this book that we were given was actually becoming a lens. And we weren't reading Revelation at all. We were just reading this guy's book. We needed yeah. to actually have the Bible there at all because he was telling us all the answers. And that, again, that's a, that's a disaster for, lit for our literacy and for our engagement. So what I want people to do is not to do that. I want them to read my commentary as a way of helping them read Revelation. They read them alongside each other. And, if, and, and therefore, you know, if people say, I, I'm not sure about that, Ian, then they'll say, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. Why do you think that? So I, I do fly a few kites, but I'm, ones I'm sure happen. I'm sure you're an, an exception. But what tends to happen in my experience is the people that are the most confident oh. about revelation tend to yeah. be the most wrong. But yeah, I'm, because because actually, if it, if you've got your own system, it's really easy to be confident in your system. Yeah, and the, and the reason for that is your system is protected from scrutiny by the text. Now, um, if you go to my bookshelf here on hermeneutics, Herman who? Is that German chap, isn't he? Uh, biblical interpretation. Or some, someone once said to me, oh, interpretation. That's the way that you make the text say what it doesn't say, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's what we all do. But what we, what we do when we interpret a text is we, we have our own presuppositions about what the text means, what it says. And we, we, you cannot not do that. You cannot not bring your own assumptions to the text, even if, you're, even if your assumption is this, is this doesn't make any sense. So um, we bring our assumptions to the text, but the qu we ask questions of the text with those assumptions. But the key thing is, will we allow the text to push back at us? Will we allow the text to question our assumptions? So a lot of readings of Revelation, what they do is they dice the text up and they kind of treat it like a jigsaw and they move the pieces around and they say, well, look, if you only slot it together this way, then look, isn't it, doesn't it make a nice picture? 
Um, in, in fact, um, Hal Lindsey, who was one of the most fa famous commentators in the sort of 70s and 80s, 60s and 70s, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, the late, yeah. great planet Earth, okay? Well, at one, at one point in his book, and I, I mentioned this in my Grove Eth books on the ethics of revelation, I, one of the things he says, at one point he actually stops and says, look, I know this may seem a bit weird that I'm chopping the text up and putting it together another way, but that's fine because just bear with me and you'll get a great picture at the end of it. <laughs> the fact that that's, yeah. the fact it bears no relation to the actual message of the text doesn't bother him. And in the end, the question is, does my reading fit the data of the text? Does the text support it? So, I mean, Dan, I think you, your question was, how do, you, how do you combat those wacky readings? How do you combat the, the things saying, oh, it's all about the vaccine and 666 is, well, it could all sorts of people. It could be Hitler. It could be Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six letters in Ronald, six letters in Ronald, six letters in Wilson, six letters in Reagan. He was the number of the beast, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Every, every age has it. Or barcodes. Barcodes, barcodes have got 666. So they've yeah. got a double line yeah. marker here. Okay. So how do you, how do you, how do you counter that? The answer is you go back to the text. Mm -hmm. Does the text support this? So people say, oh, okay. So, Barcodes are the number of the beast because it, it says, the text says, no one could buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Of course, you can't buy or sell anything without a barcode. And I go, okay, so, and the barcode is 666 because you've got a double line marker there, you've got a double line marker there, and you've got a line marker there. And they say, well, six is a double line marker in the code. And you go, well, hang on a second. Actually, it turns out that the number six in a barcode is space, bar, space, bar. And the marker on here is actually a bar, space, bar. So it isn't actually six. It's, it's almost six, but it's not quite. And they go, oh, well, that doesn't really matter. It's close enough. I go, hang on, whoa, hang on a second. Yeah, yeah. The whole premise of your argument is that Revelation 13 predicts exactly the situation we're in. It can't be approximate. And besides, it says they'll have a barcode or the mark on their forehead and on their wrist. Have you got a barcode on your forehead? Oh, they say, it'll come. But hey, well, <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> yeah. actually agree. And anyway, if you read the text, the mark of the beast functions in a literary sense as the opposite of the seal of the living God. That they get. In chapter 7, the servants of God have the seal of the living God, which marks them aside. And it turns out that, as the story goes on, the seal of the living God becomes the name of Jesus, of, of the Lamb, and of the one on the throne. And behold, they have it on their foreheads in the New Jerusalem. So I'm going to say, okay, if you think the mark of the beast is literally going to be on people's foreheads, then do you think you're literally going to be in heaven with Jesus' name tattooed on your forehead? I mean, really? Of course, nobody nobody believes that. I say, oh, okay, so you're not reading the. And then, yes, the other thing people say, well, I'm reading the text literally. I say, no, you're not. You're reading it selectively. Yeah. And again, Hal Lindsay's great thing is that the, the the these things that come out of the abyss with the, like a crowns on their head and woman's hair. He said, oh, these are these are attack helicopters. <laughs> these are the, the Apache attack yeah. helicopters. Now, now John John saw these, but of course he didn't know what a helicopter was, so he just kind of like described it over. Like and I say, well, you you can actually find websites. That demonstrate where the crown like thing is on the front of an Apache helicopter. Really, you can, you can. <laughs> but you're not reading the text literally, okay? Yeah. If you're reading the text literally, then these things literally have a woman's hair and literally have a crown. And again, what's happening is that people are saying they're doing one thing, but they're not. They're doing something, something else. So it's about testing the reading and it's about testing it against the text and what the text says. That's the, that's the way. Mm. Is, there, well, is there much? Oh, go on, Phil, you go. No, you you may flow. Go, you go for it. I, I, I was going to say, in, in terms of like church fathers and stuff, is there a lot of commentary and and engagement with Revelation? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, Revelation actually. Michael Kruger's got a really good book on the formation of canon. He points out that Revelation was actually pretty early on. The early earliest collections of canon, the earliest uh, just, um, uh, indications on the canon from the fathers. Revelation is right there. What happened is that Revelation began to fall out of. Um, confidence i think and it fell out of confidence because of a, a group the, the Mon montanists uh who was called the new prophecy movement now they were quite interesting because they were very big on the sort of millennial hope and all that and they actually thought that revelation 21 when the new jerusalem comes down on a mountain they actually believed they knew what the mountain was in phrygia and they used to go around there and so it all got a little bit out of hand uh and and so there was a move amongst the most of church followers away from uh Away, away from that, and therefore away from the book of Revelation because of all the millennium in chapter 20, and it was obviously clearly a, a dangerous thing. Um, so it was, it, so Revelation fell out of popularity, but it did, it was um, established in the fourth century as, as part of the agreed canon. Um, 
And the earliest co full commentary we have, I have on my shelf here, is by Andrew of Caesarea. And you're going to ask me what date Andrew was, and I can't remember. So no, sorry. no, I wouldn't uh, do so that. Uh, so I go to <laughs> Google or Wikipedia to help me. Um, so you can so, say anything like. <laughs> so, so, so it oh, sounds yeah. like then the, the temptation to read Revelation poorly is yeah. is actually also quite early as well. Oh, you know, uh, so either, it, either, it, uh, absolutely, it is. And 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 yeah. and again, it does. It it marks um, a shift away from that kind of apocalyptic language. Um, and I think there's, well, there's some, there's some very obvious evidence that if you actually turn to your, in your Bible, if you turn to Revelation 13, 18 in your Bible, you'll find that there's a footnote. So uh, the main text of Revelation 13, 18 in most English Bibles says, uh, the number of the beast is, um, this calls for wisdom, that those who have insight calculate the number of the beast for it's the number of a man, and that number is 666. And actually, it so happens the Bible I've picked up doesn't, but almost all English translations have a footnote saying some ancient manuscripts say 616. Mm. And that's uh, a quite early papyrus, which is found in a place called Oxyrhynchus in Egypt, in a rub big rubbish dump of manuscripts, because it's in the desert in Egypt. That's, it preserves um, parchments. And the, um, actually, the, the, the common, the, the, the most convincing, the cons I'd say scholarly consensus interpretation of 666, is that it's an allusion to Nero, Emperor Nero. Uh, and the reason is, you can read all about that in Richard Balkan's great volume called The Climax of Prophecy. And he's got a big study on numerology in the Book of Revelation, which I think is, is good. And I've, I've actually developed that further and done some further research in that area. Because um, my first degree is pure maths, I like the numbers. So that's good. Mm -hmm. What goes around comes around. Um, and the reason is, if you, if you take Nero Caesar and you take the word beast in Greek, and if you write them in Hebrew letters, and if you do the thing which is very common in the ancient world, which is you you actually work out their value, and the reason for that is that in the ancient world, they didn't have a separate number system. Letters had not had values. So every word had a value, which is the sum of the numbers associated with its letter. Then the word beast adds up to 666, and the name Nero Caesar adds up to 666. And again, that's very common practice. Is it, The Greek word is isopsephism. Iso means the same. Sephizo means to calculate. So you've got the the word beast and you've got the name Nero Caesar. They have the same value. So John is saying, look, -da, you see, the beast is Nero or the beast is Roman imperial power as Nero practiced it. And the reason why that's, that's I think, watertight convincing is that if you if you write the word of the beast, which is not therion, but theriou in Greek, and if you write Nero Caesar rather than Neron Caesar, you drop 50 off each word. So you then get the, number, the value 616. And it, it seems to me the best interpretation is that the guy who copied the text at Oxyrhynchus, he knew what John was talking about, but he thought John had got his sums wrong, so he corrected it. So he ended up getting 616 instead of 666. He thought John had, had misspelled Nero's name. And that, I think, is very convincing evidence. Well, it's evidence that this is the right solution. But it's also evidence that, look, here you are one generation later or so, and subsequently, so one generation, they, he knew the answer. The first, this first copy is knew the answer, knew knew what was going on. After that, the the solution is lost. So we have no one in the in the fathers who knows what the meaning reference of six 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 is. So already by the second century, culture has moved on sufficiently mm. to create the problem of revelation being strange. You use the language revelation being weird. I would say weird's the wrong word. Strange is the right word in the sense that it yes. is strange to us. But actually, it's a reminder that all of Scripture is strange to us. Can I give you two examples? Yeah, yeah. go for it, please. Okay, well, so Mark chapter 1, uh, beginning of the Gospel, John comes to the desert, prepare a straight way. Jesus comes to him and is baptized, comes out of the water. And what has got, what does he, he hears a voice from heaven who says, This is my son. Yeah. This is my son, the beloved, with you I'm well pleased. Mm. And we go, we all say, Oh, yeah. Isn't that nice? <laughs> God's patting Jesus on the head and saying, good lad. You know, you've had other sermons saying you get affirmation before you go into ministry. You know, you minister out of God's affirmation. Of you. Yeah, except that. Except that. Well, well, that's not quite what God was saying, because actually that phrase combines three biblical illusions. So it combines Abraham, take your son, your beloved son, and do what? Seven. Sacrifice him. Of course, yeah. Okay, so number one. Number two, Psalm 2, verse 7. Uh, to the, the 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 psalm of royal enthronement says that God says to the king today you have become my son. Number three, Isaiah forty three I think the first seven song, 
uh, this is my servant with whom I'm well pleased. Actually, we think, pat on the head, actually what God is saying to Jesus is, you're, you're my sacri sacrifice, <laughs> you are a royal king, and you're the servant with whom I'm well pleased, who will give his, chapter, it goes on chapter 15, who will, who, will, who, who, will, who will suffer for the people to redeem them. So, uh, and so all I'm saying, it's a strange world in the sense that we don't read texts with that kind of attention to detail. Again, this detailed multiple allusion to the Old Testament. Um, and then there's, there's, I mean, numerical composition isn't just in Revelation. Numerical composition is all over. So um, here's an example I read um, a couple of years ago. Um, I haven't actually tested it out myself. Uh, going back to speech, speech of Pentecost, chapter, chapter, Acts chapter 2, um, a, 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 a recently died a Dutch um, Dutch. Dutch theologian, I think Martin Menkel, he observed that Peter's speech is in two halves. Both halves are the same length. They're each 444, para, uh, 444 syllables. 444 plus 444 makes 888. 888 is the gematria value of the name Jesus in Greek. Wow. You can see where people get their Bible code stuff from. <laughs> well, you can, except, except the difference is the difference is the Bible code again. What the Bible code stuff does is it takes words at random and sticks them together and goes, Oh, look, a number. Right. What, yeah. what, what observing numerical composition in a text does is it puts the text into its cultural context and its world and says, Look, yeah. when you live in a world where the only way you can get a copy of a text is by paying a scribe to copy, the, the scribe is going to charge you by counting the words. So counting words is something that people did all the time in the first century. Mm -hmm. And it is another way of giving meaning. And here's the thing, Bible code, the meaning of the code is completely different from the meaning of the text. With numerical composition of scripture, it's the, the numerology reinforces the meaning of the text. So for example, in Revelation, Jesus is repeatedly described as the faithful witness. Yeah. And those who follow Jesus are invited to be faithful witnesses witness is a huge theme in revelation as it is in the gospel of john the name jesus comes 14 times in the text 14 is two times seven yeah. okay seven is the number of completeness perfection there are seven seas there are seven planets in the ancient world there are seven days of the week two is the number of testimony witness because in deuteronomy 17 it says do not believe the testimony of one person you must two witnesses must agree Actually, we find that in, in Mark 14. They could not find any two witnesses who would agree. Two is the number of witness. Seven is the number of completeness. Two times seven is the number of Jesus because he is the faithful witness. So what I'm saying is that, that the numerology isn't a secret code, which means which tells you the text is something different from what you thought it was. It's a way of reinforcing it. It is a strange way. It's strange to us. I, I, mean, I don't know if you ever read a novel and thought, that's funny. The word opportunity came 22 times in that chapter. It's not the sort of thing you know. Well, I mean, you might do. If somebody did do that, you'd call them weird. But it's a it's a common practice in the ancient world. This thing about um, the gematria, the the number of the beast. A friend of mine's done research on inscriptions, and he's found um, he's found all over. Uh, he's found it, he's found it in Ephesus. He's found it in Smyrna. He's found it in Pompeii. Inscriptions where you find that somebody saying, "I love her whose number is five four five." I love her whose number is 74. And, and, and the, great, you know, the, the thing is that if you don't know who that is, you won't know who it's referring to. But, of course, the two people involved know because they've worked out their own numbers. Wow. And really fascinatingly, in one example, I love her whose number is 76 in the atrium, in the public space, in a private room. He says, I was with Thalia. Guess what? Thalia, her name adds up to 76. So in public, he's put it in code. In private, is put who the person is. So, so again, you can see this sort of thing is happening all the time in the ancient world. And in that sense, Revelation is a strange text to us, not because it's kind of weird and wacky, but because it belongs to a different culture, and it's a culture with, with which we're not familiar. But that's why that's why we are that's why we were to read the text together. Scripture mm. is a gift to us as a community, as the people of God. So we are to read it with each other. Um, and uh, uh, we're, to, we're to read it with scholars, with experts, with people in different situations, with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, because the, the scripture has been given us to us as, as, a, as a gift to the community. When people read it on their own, that's when you get wacky, difficult ideas. And a lot of their wacky ideas about end times and dispensations and tri tribulation, all that, 
uh, originate with a disaffected Anglican clergyman called John Nelson Darby, mm -hmm. um, who founded the Plymouth Brethren in eight, about it was 1832, I think he went off and came up with this idea of revelation. That's what, well, number one, it shows you that disillusioned Anglican clergymen are dangerous. <laughs> but it, it also shows you that if you go off in a room and read it all by yourself and magically think up, whoa, I think the text means this, that, that's when you get problems. So, because Dar Darby ended up being then well connected with Moody and it, it sort of snowballed a little bit. It did, yeah. And it, but although, having said that, it was a relatively minor view until 1909 when Schofield published his um, study Bible. That's okay. that's the other reason. One of my one of my controversial convictions is that study Bibles are of the devil. That's not no, it's controversial. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a great snippet when we oh, uh, yeah, yeah, study Bibles, are the, study Bibles the, are of the devil. The reason is uh, when you when when Dan when you read my commentary, you won't be able to confuse it with the Bible because they're in two different books. Okay, so you might <laughs> want to say, "Well, I believe the Bible." I'm not quite sure about this Ian Paul fella. And that's okay. But you see, what would happen if I published a Bible and I put my comments at the bottom of the page on the Bible? It's much harder for you to say, well, I don't really agree with that because it can't think, oh, hang on a second, that's in my Bible. Isn't, is that, isn't that the word of God? And actually, Darby's, Darby's interpretation only really gained popularity when Schofield published it on the same page. Oh, right. The Bible. Is so, that, did, did he, um, is that why... Um, you know, young earth creationism stuff had such a was that related to Schofield as well in terms of his his interpretations of Genesis? I don't know. Sorry, that's beyond my pay grade. Yeah. No, right. <laughs> I, I, I know about. The I, didn't want, I didn't want to get that, go down that yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah, I think, no, 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 no. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure we got Schofield to blame for that as well. Well, possibly. He's got a lot to answer for. Yeah, maybe no, 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 that, that, that's slightly different. And that's what happens when you take a pre-modern text and then you you put post post-modern scientific questions against it. I mean, you know, people. I've, oh dear, got into a debate on Facebook about this. Did 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 uh, this is a bit of a aside? Did Paul think that Adam was a literal figure? Um, I'd say, yeah, probably. Does that mean we should? No, because Paul was a first century Jew, and I'm not, and we live in a scientific worldview. So it's about translating from one context to another. Mm. I, I'm That's sure that I'm sure that I'm sure that Paul did not believe in quantum physics either. I'm sure Jesus. Did. I did ask somebody. I said, "Do you think Jesus believed in quantum physics?" They said, "Well, he's the Son of God. He believed. He knew that. Of course, he did." I said, "What?" So it was just a bit too complicated to tell the disciples. And I think the problem then is you're not you're not taking the incarnation seriously. You're not taking the, the idea that the Son of God actually became a first oh, century yeah. Jew. But sorry, that that I'm but, getting into some other. Yeah, that's a whole other can of work. We're going to have to. Have that that <laughs> We've got enough of the book of Revelation, haven't we? Got enough worms yeah. already coming out the can. Yeah, but there's, <laughs> I'll be interested just just on that front. So we, we've got this danger of reading the Bible on our own, but I mean that that's a massive issue in the Western Church anyway. Yeah. Um, I think that we can, there is an element that we can be devoted, read Scripture, and understand it in a way that it will speak to our to us. Yeah, you you've got a book on that I think is fairly new on how to read Revelation as an ordinary reader. Um, how, how do you marry that, that we, we want to encourage people to read scripture, possibly communally, but also how do you teach people to recognize when things are going off piste into a bit of a strange direction? And things yeah. like Left Behind is obviously left yeah. a, a massive yeah. issue with Revelation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, 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 do we, how do you encourage people to avoid that? I, well, um... I think uh, there's some of the things we've already talked about. So if Revelation is part of the part of the Bible, we might kind of expect it to say, tell the same kind of story. Mm. Um, and, and that actually has been a, a particular test of text, test of what is in the scripture and what isn't. So, for instance, if you take the so-called Gospel of Thomas as an example, people say, oh, well, why did the church exclude it? How exclusive? Why can't we call, we call it? And the reason is it just doesn't tell the same story. So the, I actually read the Gospel of Thomas when I was a teenager. Um, because I read a book by F.F. F. Bruce called Christ Jesus and Christian Oranges Outside the New Testament. And chapter five, I think it was, uh, said, Gospel Thomas consists of 114 sayings. These are, and he just went, <laughs> went through them all. So I read really? it. Okay, fine. I didn't realize that people were going to make a big fuss about it 30 years later. Um, but one of the striking things about, well, two the striking things about the Gospel Thomas. First of all, it's not a gospel. A gospel is an announcement of something that has happened. 
the Gospel of Thomas is just a collection of decontextualized sayings. But the Gospels include Jesus' teaching, but they include Jesus' teaching within a story about his life and the fact that the, the Gospels are, are ancient lives, bioi, of Jesus saying, this thing happened. And in particular saying, God has done a particular thing through this person, Jesus. And, and Thomas doesn't do that. And the second thing is that the Gospels do, we, um, we're so familiar with it, we might not even realize. Every single one of the four Gospels says, God has done something through this person, Jesus, in fulfillment of what he promised in the scriptures. And the Gospel of Thomas says the opposite. Basically, the Gospel of Thomas contrasts Jesus with all that nasty Old Testament stuff. Yeah. So that's really distinctive. And of course, what does Revelation do? Revelation does at its center say God has done something. Um, God has done something in this person of Jesus. And that the center pivot is actually chapter 12, where uh, there's a weird story using that Leto myth, but then it becomes a sort of Jewish thing about Michael and his angels. And then for those who haven't understood either of those, John says, okay, let me make it clear. Let's sing a hymn, shall we? <laughs> the, 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 the Satan who accuses the brethren day night has been thrown down by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. In other words, God has done a cosmic thing of defeating Satan through the death of Jesus. He's defeated. Of course, that's exactly what John 12 says. You know, Jesus says, now has come the hour for the judgment of this prince of this world. Uh, and that's what John says, where he says, you know, on the cross, Jesus, on the resurrected cross, Jesus led the powers of darkness in a victory procession. and all kinds. So it says the same sort of thing. So Revelation is agreeing with the Gospels. God has done something in this person, Jesus, and it agrees that it's for the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise, right from the very first verse to the very end. So Jesus is the one who has redeemed people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. He's the one through whom we are. A, a, a kingdom of, he has made us a this is chapter one verse seven he's made us a kingdom of priests that's the fulfillment of god's promise in exodus 19 verse 6 so it's like revelation is saying all the things that god had promised to do in the old testament every single one of them has come come true through jesus um he's formed this pure people for himself this really um, i think just just on that i'm aware of time and just one sort of hmm. question Oh, and also, I did say to you that I'd get carried away once we've gone to no, Revelation. It's, so, it's, it's so good. There's, there's lots I, know, of, there's, I, know I find it difficult to say things like that. <laughs> I haven't actually answered your question, Dan. Though, have I? Sorry, I haven't answered the question. Your question is was about how do we? Well, how do we know we're going off off track, off piece, or something? Yeah. No, how do we? How, how do we know if we're going going off track? Okay. Number one, when we start thinking that Revelation is saying something different from the Gospels and Paul. Mm -hmm. context, number two. Number two, it doesn't match the text. Number three, it steps outside the historic tradition of the church is sort of understanding this text. So uh, I've got one of the books on my shelves called Reading the Bible with the Dead. You know, we're not the first people to actually read this text. So it might be worth checking back and seeing what other people thought. As far as I'm aware, Luther doesn't mention any Apache attack helicopters. And that might just flag up, you know, just flag up a little sort of thing to us. The other, the, the, the other test, a crucial test is what happens when we talk to other people who are different from us? Mm. It's all very well getting into a little Facebook group of, you know, end times, blah, 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 anti-vax, whatever. Actually, what happens when we when we talk to other people with different perspectives and they ask us some difficult questions? Do, does it stack up then? And that's, that's, again, a crucial part of uh, reading scriptures together, one another. So so coherence with the Gospels and Paul, uh, the context, uh, the story, does it, what about previous interpreters? What about other people in the world today, you know? So I think those are some crucial tests. That's that's really really helpful. That sort of framework, and I, I just would be interested. Does it agree uh, with my commentary? No, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's the, I've, I've really found your, your commentary helpful, and I'm working through it myself. But just See, on, Dan, on that see, front, see? <laughs> Dan, you should get it. Is <laughs> if what, what still I on found the fence. in engaging with this is you've got people that will have created these systems of revelation, and then read that back into the old into the rest of the bible yeah, and so then you have this sort of it, they, they, they've got their they've got their story genesis to revelation but technically it's revelation then mapped onto genesis to revelation yeah, 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 for sure. so so how just, just on that front i, I completely get the, your what your your thread of genesis to revelation but if someone's got a wonky thread <laughs> how, how do you help them unpick that when they're okay. I see Derby. I see that as the gospel narrative. Absolutely, absolutely. And and of course, they're going to throw in one Thessalonians four. We'll meet the God in the air, in the yeah. in the plasma in the air, and they throw in uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six, and uh, two men will be in a field, one be taken away. Okay, again, the simple the answer is, what does the text say? 
what does the text say? So uh, here's here's a really here's a C.S. Lewis said this is I'm just just getting the text up here on my screen. This is the most embarrassing verse in the whole Bible. Is Matthew twenty four uh, verse thirty four? Matthew thirty twenty four verse thirty four, which says this: "Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away." until all these things have taken place <laughs> so what does that mean well it means jesus says truly 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 i tell you really honestly this is the solemn saying look be absolutely clear people this is what he's saying guys look if you get if, if this stuff i've been talking about is confusing you let me just get one thing clear all this will happen in your lifetime okay just to avoid any confusion <laughs> of course right. what that means is all the stuff Jesus has been talking about, about the sun, the moon, dark, and the sun, the stars falling from heaven, the son of man coming on the clouds, all that, Jesus says, is going to happen in your lifetime. Here's the more embarrassing thing. Matthew, writing some years later, believed Jesus was right. That it had. Mm -hmm. And that, so I just said, you know, if I'm getting, I've, I was getting a bit of a punch up with something today because I posted about the Ascension yesterday, the Ascension Day today, and, and about the language of coming on the clouds. When, when, when the, when in like in this, in this section, when it says, talks about the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, that is picking up Daniel 7 verse 13. But Daniel has the visions in the night, the seas, which represent the people of the world, the beasts come up, which represent the four successive empires, last one being Rome. And then one like a son of man, which represents Israel, comes on the clouds. But he doesn't, he doesn't, the son of man doesn't come from heaven on the clouds to earth, he comes to the throne. To the ancient of days and is giving an everlasting kingdom. Mm. Jesus quoted that in Mark 14 in the trial, and that's why the high priest tore his cloak because he says, You're claiming to be the exalted Israel who comes to Almighty God and is given an everlasting kingdom. That's blasphemy. Mm. That's exactly mm. what Stephen, that's just when Stephen sees when he's stoned in Acts 7. Acts 7. And he looks up to heaven, he sees Jesus at the right hand of the power. He's, he sees Jesus exalted. That's what the New Testament believes. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of Man who's been exalted. On the clouds, he was taken on the clouds as ascension, on the clouds to the throne of God. What's the central image of the book of Revelation? The Lamb on the throne with the one seated on the throne. And so that's what it's all about. Jesus says, you, This will happen in your generation. Jesus will be exalted at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and once, once, so, and that's what the text actually says. If you just have to look at it carefully, be aware of the Old Testament context. And then once you get to think, Oh, okay. And that whole series of things sort of uh, unfolds there. Um, well, you know, one Thessalonians four, I say to people, okay, so hang on, so Jesus is going to come from heaven. His this is his, this is his. Paul says this is his revelation, his manifestation. This is his epiphany. He uses that language, epiphania, in one Thessalonians four. This is when the whole world is going to see Jesus. It's not a secret rapture. So Jesus, epiphania, epiphania, he's coming from heaven. We're going to be caught up and meet him in the air. Sorry, I can't match my. <laughs> So here's the thing. Jesus is being revealed to the whole of humanity. We meet him in the air. The question is, who turns around? Yeah. Why, why in this rapture stuff do people assume Jesus turns around and go back to heaven? That's not an epiphania. That's not a manifestation of Jesus of the world. No. This is the, he's using the language, parousia, of an emperor coming to a city. When the emperor comes to the city, because he doesn't do it very often, he comes. The elders leave the city. Hooray, hooray, it's the emperor's here. And they meet him. What do they then do? It's the elders who turn around. And they get sorry, right around here. Yeah, no, we're, we're trying to work out which, which side of the screen. Okay, so here, here's, here's the emperor <laughs> yeah, yeah. coming from across the sea. Talk, um, Lewis used this language, didn't he, about the, the emperor across the sea. So the emperor comes from across the sea to your city in Turkey in Asia. And the, the, emperor, the, the elders come out of the city to greet the emperor and they meet. And what happens? It's the elders who turn around and they both go together into the city. So that the, the elders can say, oh, look, we were using the, exercising the authority of the emperor, and here he is to, should, to vindicate us. And we're going to rule with him now, and you've got to do what we say, because we're exercising his authority. So let's just turn it sideways. Here comes King Jesus from heaven, from across the seas, as it were, across the skies, to city earth. Here we are, exercising his authority, living under his lordship, but nobody recognizes it. What happens? We meet him in the air. Who turns around? We do. Yeah. And we re-enter city earth to reign with Jesus forever. That's the promise of Revelation. And the saints will reign with him on earth forever. And all will see, A, that Jesus is Lord, and B, that we've been exercising his authority all the time and they didn't recognize it. 
That's the image. That's the image that Paul's doing. Oh, it's an exercise good. again. It's an exercise in recognizing this is a strange text. It belongs to a different culture where they have language of imperial power and parousias and all that kind of stuff. And it's about entering, going into that culture and, and recognizing what Paul is saying to them, how they were understood at the time. I think that's good news. Thank you. Yeah, and good news. There's, there's, there's a lot in there. I've really appreciated uh, all of that. And I, I think there's there's another conversation you had. I've enjoyed the things on your blog that uh, I'd love people to, to go to. You pronounced it properly. I did. <laughs> I've never been able to pronounce it. Can you specify? Uh, it just doesn't come. No, 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 no. Well, look, if you've got a, have you got a bike, Phil? Uh, well, I used to have a motorbike, but. Um, okay, what no. kind of tyres does it have on it? They're filled with air, so they're called, yeah. right. <laughs> they're called pneumatic tyres, right? Pneumatic tires. Oh, that's what I was going for. Yeah, that's, that's the word. So, yeah, yeah, okay, so. So it's got a silent P, which is pneuma, is the word for spirit or breath. So, yeah, yep, They've got a silent P on the front, so I'm the same. I'm Sefidzo with a silent P. Sefidzo, there we go. Sefidzo. I, I can do that. Sefidzo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so go to yeah, it's much easier just to search for Ian Paul blog. That's the best way. There you go. That does that does come up? You're on mute, Dan. It looks great, but I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I do. I just type Ian Paul because I try to. Ian Paul blog. It comes up. Yeah. Yeah. I still Phil. I still haven't asked your question. One of the things I say to people on reading Revelation is, look. You don't. You need to engage brain. You don't need to become an academic, but mm. you need to. You need to ask sensible questions about the text. And actually, these are questions you ask all the time. You do it all the time when you pick up a book, a book to read. You know, bedtime reading. You, your your brain goes, "What kind of book is this?" You know, if you're reading a history of trees, you don't read it in the same way that you read a fantasy novel. Your brain says, "What kind of writing is this?" When something doesn't make sense, you think, I wonder why the author said that. What were what were the living? You know, you might read a book about travels to India. You might say, Well, I wonder what it's like in there. How does that make you know? You recognize that people live in different contexts. So if we do that with ordinary books, why don't we do it with Revelation? Why don't we just sort of say, What kind of writing is this? It's different. Why don't we sort of ask the question, what world did John live in? How would his readers have heard this? We do we we actually manage to do it with other parts of the Bible. When we read Paul's letters to Corinth, we say, well, what were the Corinthians doing? What was Corinth like? We might even get a map out and say, you know, what's, where is it on the map? If only when I was a teenager, well, Baptist church, well, we just got a flipping map out and we'd seen where those seven cities were. Somebody yeah. said, I don't think they are the seven ages of the church. They look very much to me like seven cities. It would have helped us an awful lot. It's just doing stuff that people know how to do, but not just not disengaging as if this text just needs to be treated like it's magic. And decoded and, and decoded, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we haven't even touched on like millennium and things like that, but there's there's a lot on your, your blog which I was going to point people to. There is, there is, with um, there, there is. With revelation, but also I, I really appreciated the, the sort of things that you tackle with regards to the, the myths we Christians peddle, especially around uh, Christmas mm -hmm. with things like Jesus born in a stable and it wasn't. Um, it's just great. I say to people, look at Luke 2. Where's the stable? And they go, I know it's here somewhere, but somehow <laughs> I can't see it just now. I wonder why. The answer is, I, it's not there. <laughs> I, I love blowing my, my daughter's mind at Christmas. I'm a big, I'm, I'm, I am I'm love ruining what people think about oh, the nativity. No, no and she, that, no. and then, no, no, she starts talking about oh, the stable. Children. I was like, sweetheart, do you know that, that, that it, it, it wasn't a stable? She starts about three kings. I was like, do you know, it never, it never actually says three kings and then and then and then we go first go there wasn't a donkey there well it doesn't uh, it doesn't say there was it definitely a donkey. wasn't because donkeys yeah. people with more money they walked again so, in the ancient world people walked everywhere jesus walked everywhere and when palm really? sunday comes that was really odd because jesus n walks everywhere by the way palms aren't mentioned in mark and matthew and branches aren't mentioned at all in Luke. In Luke, it's Cloak Sunday. They only put the cloaks down. It's cloaks. Yeah. So once every four years, it's Cloak Sunday. What, it's only what John's done? gospel he mentions palms. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so uh, go, go <laughs> to Fitzo. So, 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 there we go. I can get Go to Fitzo. Ian Paul blog. Ian Paul blog. And uh, also get his, <laughs> uh, his book. Um, here, here we, we have 
gone over time, but we, we have one more question and feel free to plug any other books that you've written or engaged with. But what, what would be your top resources for Revelation, but also just for any Christian out there? What, have you, what would you recommend people get engaged with? Ooh. My friend Andrew Wilson's written a lovely, he'll thank me for this. He's written a great little book called The God of All Things about reflecting mm. on the material world. I'm enjoying that at the moment. It's good. Andrew Wilson. As, as yeah. am I. Oh, great. There you go. Um, get my commentary. D Dan, Dan, you've got to get my commentary. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do try and steer a middle course. I do. Oh, by the way, guys, my commentary is 144,000 words long. You, well, that is... How about that? How about that? It's actually 143,985, but I thought it was close enough. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's got a Greek. It's got a Greek pun on my wife. On the pun on my wife's name in Greek in the introduction as well. So you spot that. Um, I had to explain that to her. She, yeah, she, <laughs> uh, I try and steer a middle course between look looking at all the interpretive issues, but actually saying there's there's something to live here. So it is actually applied. I hope Dan, Phil, you found that as well. That. It's actually, uh, isn't it saying there's some theology here. Take away, it's going to make a difference to your life. So, um, if you want to go more academic and you want to look at all the detail, the best commentary ever is a guy called Craig Kirster. He's got a big fat anchor Bible commentary. Uh, he, he really does it well. He covers all the options and gives. I disagree with him on three things, but apart from that, he seems to have got everything right. Um, that's my alarm. So go and put the bins out. Um, yeah. Uh, I've I've done a, a little study booklet here with London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. If you want to do this in a group, it's a six section six session Bible study called Revelation, Faithfulness, and Testing Times. So it does tackle. It's got little asides in it as well, explanatory notes, a little asides here on different particular subjects and questions as well. So you've got a little bit of a side, and it you know helps you get into the text. Uh, if you want to just look at the New Testament generally, this has just come out this week, which hey. is a textbook that I've I've contributed to. It's a third edition, fully revised and expanded, called Exploring the New Testament. That's just you know, if you want to know a bit about, well, who wrote the letter of the Hebrews? What does it say? What are the major themes? How do I read it? Uh, what are the controversial issues? Good sort of introductory stuff. Um, so people use that for their beginning study of theology, but you can actually use that in a local church as well. Got all sorts of good things there. Um, or other stuff on Revelation. God, I've got, I have got a whole Billy bookcase of text. On you kind of have to if you're going to write a commentary on it. Uh, you do really. I've got, I've got 43 yeah. commentaries there. So there are, there's, there are some, there are some good, interesting stuff around. Um, yeah, again, if you want to look at some of the big in-depth issues, again, a friend of mine, Richard Borkham, who uh, was a professor at St. Andrews, he's retired now, he's in Cambridge. Um, he's got some great stuff. His big book's called The Climax of Prophecy. He's also written a little book called The Theology of the Book of Revelation, which is which found is really, that one good. Yeah, it's really, oh, really, great, really great value. He packs in so much from there. His big book on the climax of prophecy has got the most extended study of numerology in Revelation. That's good. That's good stuff. If you, want to, if you want to get into that, awesome. Awesome. Wacky <laughs> wild, wacky wild wild secondary maths for a bit, but I'm, I'm not that big into my numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amazing. There's, there's some great books out there, actually. I mean, I mentioned Andrew Wilson's book, but um, uh, it's really interesting in lockdown. It seems to me that Christian publishing is doing well, actually. I think a lot of people have been reaching for books as well, when I was a, when I was a came to faith, I mean, that's what you did as a Christian. You read your Bible, had your quiet time, and you always read a Christian book mm. all the time. Everyone's doing it. Not so much nowadays, but I don't know whether Christian book publishing is reviving a bit. It's just a it's just just a great way to build your faith. Yeah, there's tons yeah. of good books coming out. So, my, um, right. my friend works for a good book company, and they, they uh, got yeah, tons yeah, of good yeah. stuff coming yeah, out. Yeah, that I'm really, really fantastic. Impressed. That fantastic apologetic series they've got. Yeah. You know, with, um, Am I just my brain? Amy or um, Ewing and Yeah, and, uh, Why Does God Care About Who I Sleep With by Sam yeah. Sam Aubrey, isn't it? Yeah, so some yeah. really, really good stuff. And um the Oxford Methodician guy, John, John Lennox. Uh, John Lennox. Yeah. Yeah. It is coronavirus, but which yeah, I think yeah, is yeah. extremely yeah. popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because there's great stuff around. Awesome. Well we've we've had um some good comments coming through. Thanks, Claire, for for joining hey. us tonight. And uh, yeah, we've had uh this one was quite funny. Uh Thank you. Did I mention I read a comment? No, <laughs> 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 and then uh, another one from Dan. Now this has been good. Minded again, like discussion. discussion. Sincerity is only as good as it is connected to reality. So thanks oh, again. Ooh, cool. So yeah, we have had a few people watching. Great. 
Was, uh, yeah, so some people do think about and and no, I, I haven't mentioned. <laughs> yeah, so uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I am also the uh, the hell project on on Twitter. So that's that's me. And, yeah, of uh, course, of course. We, we Here's ended the fascinating up. thing, isn't it? Here's the, I yeah. got into a bit of a punch up with somebody on Facebook about that. And uh, so, the question is: so I just said something. So, what does Paul say about hell? <laughs> Not very much. <laughs> actually, it's something about eternal all. destruction. Eternal destruction is the closest oh, wow. we get. Yeah, it is. It is. And I just said, and I, said I said, do you think we should? So, Paul actually doesn't mention hell at all. Do you think we can learn anything from that? Like, yeah. Uh, well, no. We don't just have to do what Paul tells us. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if Jesus if somebody says that, you know they're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Craig, you've started this now. This is Craig's fault. Uh, we'll we'll oh, have okay. you on another time. And okay, I know yeah, there's yeah. you've you've spoken to the rethinking hell guys a bit. As I, well, did, I did. I did. Yeah. 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 I was a bit well. nervous about that. I thought it all went wrong in the middle, but apparently they said it was fine. So there you go. Yeah. Good. Cool. I recommend your stuff, and thank you so much for, for spending your evening with us. Really enjoyed hey, it. Hey, there's nothing I'd rather do, he says, hoping, wishing you could out in the garden again. I did cut my lawn before I came on. I got the bins to do. I'm going to go, go out, even though it's dark, I'm going to go out and get my iPhone torch, and I'm going to seed the lawn and water it. And, and, so. <laughs> got, to, got to redeem the time, you know. Oh, it's good to have you on again. Maybe we can talk about hell for Craig's benefit. <laughs> we can talk. Listen, I'll tell you what, excellent thing to listen to. Michael Mosley's uh, Radio 4 thing, just one thing. Just one thing. So just in each episode, just one thing you can do to, to be a bit healthier. Eat fermented food, do press-ups, go and stand in a wood. Natural Sounds nature. Amazing. Have I'm a cold shower. Have a cold shower. God, that's great stuff. In, intermittent right. fasting all that intermittent joke. fasting that's uh, magical right. yeah yeah i do that excellent awesome, awesome. yeah thank you thank, thank you so much Ian. it's a real, hey, real great pleasure to see you and pleasure. i'm talking to you see, cool. see you again i'll just, I'll and, just close and, it. and dan <laughs> just just dan get the book man. <laughs> i've opened up my amazon wish list and i'm just putting it in there to remember and it will uh good stuff nice. it will make its way right. there Phil, you I guys can carry on in a sec. I'm just going to close yeah. this off. <laughs> Thanks okay. all for watching. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ian, for your time. And we'll um, finish finish there. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, get his commentary. Get the books that he's recommended. And uh, thanks once again. Big thanks to our patrons. Uh, really grateful for your support and helping us uh, get StreamYard paid for and uh, a, a bit of kit as well. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com. But we do this for fun and we get to have a laugh as well. Have a very good evening. Our next chat is on Tuesday next week with Randall Rouser about uh, Jesus Loves the Canaanites, uh, a book he's written in response to Joshua and a debate he had uh, with an atheist. Uh, we're going to be talking with him on Tuesday night. Come and join us. Otherwise, catch up on YouTube or our Facebook page. And uh, again, once again, thank you for watching. Thanks for being a part of this. And we'll see you later.